Amen. Let's take the Word of God, please, and go to the book of 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter number 5, and I have a message I want to give you tonight that uh, I believe will be a simple one. I believe it will be one that we can pretty easily uh, take it, and then I pray that we'll apply it and use it in our lives. 1 Peter chapter number 5, 1 Peter chapter number 5, and we'll read here uh, the first nine verses of this chapter. It's a, it's a wonderful chapter. Um, and uh, has some truth in it that we can use in our lives that would make a difference, make a difference if we would apply it. First Peter chapter number 5, we'll begin reading in verse 1. Peter says, The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder, yea, all of you be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility, for God resisteth the proud, and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God, that He may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon Him, for He careth for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren, that are in the world. I would like for you to notice, please, in verse number 7, this injunction from the Lord in verse 7, casting all your care upon Him. Casting all your care upon Him, the Bible says, for He careth for you. It's a wonderful verse, and we're going to take that, and we'll look at that tonight. Let's pray together as we begin. Father, thank You for the privilege and opportunity to take the Word of God and uh, share and break forth the bread of life among the people. I pray that, Lord, uh, all of us would be fed spiritually by the Word of God. Help us, strengthen us. I pray that you would use it in our lives in a mighty way. Give us a breakthrough where we need it. I pray that you would remove distractions from our minds. I pray, Lord, that you would cleanse our minds. And I pray that we would be ready to receive what you have for us. Lord, speak clearly. May we listen intently to the Lord. And for all that's accomplished, we'll thank you and we'll praise you for it. Thank you for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and all that He has done on our behalf. Help us to learn what it means to cast our care upon Him. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The elder here that is writing this is the Apostle Peter, and he is writing this specifically to the elders, and he says, I'm exhorting you as an elder. And so he's dealing with the pastors. He's dealing with the bishops. And my intention is not to deal, of course, with that part tonight. But he tells these elders that are part of the church here, and specifically those who were part of these 12 tribes scattered abroad. Peter says, feed the flock of God which is among you. This is what the pastor is commanded to do. Feed the flock of God which is among you. I've been meditating on what Christ said. When he said to Peter, the same apostle, but he said to Peter before he left, and this is for all of us, but he said to Peter, lovest thou me more than these? Remember that? Lovest thou me more than these? And then he said the second time, lovest thou me more than these? And Peter says, yes, Lord, you know that I love thee. And then he says the third time, Lovest thou me more than these? But you know what? In the first two times, when our Lord spoke to Peter, his response after Peter said, Thou knowest that I love thee, he said, Feed my sheep. And then after Jesus asked the third time, Lovest thou me more than these? And Peter was grieved that he continued to ask and said, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. Then the Lord Jesus responded by not saying, feed my sheep, but he said, feed my lambs. 
And in every flock there are always sheep and there are lambs. In every flock there are the sheep who are the mature ones who can take the meat. The Bible says that they had their senses exercised to discern between good and evil. They can take that meat. And then there's those who are the newborn babes who must receive the milk of the word that they may grow thereby. And so in every flock there's going to be sheep and there's going to be lambs. And the Lord Jesus said, Peter, I want you to feed my sheep. I want you to feed my sheep. This is what Peter was given by the Lord to do. And this was his job. He's, and then as he speaks to the elders in the church, he says, feed the flock of God which is among you. So the very same thing that the Lord Jesus had given Peter to do, now Peter turns around and says, this is what the bishop, this is what the pastor, this is what the elder is responsible to do. He is to feed the flock. And he is not only to feed the flock, but he is to take the oversight thereof. And then he says, not only is he taking the oversight of the flock, as a shepherd would look after his sheep and he has to watch all of them, he has to watch the flock, he has to have the oversight, he sees things before the sheep see them, he sees them after the sheep see them, he sees things that the sheep do not ever see. But then he says, not by constraint. In other words, a true shepherd, a true bishop, uh, a true elder, we could say, is someone who does not serve God because he thinks that he has to, or grudgingly, or of necessity. But a true bishop, a true man with a pastor's heart, is someone who serves willingly. In other words, this is the very will that he has. He has the desire to do this. Paul says to Timothy that if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A man who is a true bishop has to desire the work. And he says, not a filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. There are people serving the Lord today that serve the Lord for money. There are people that are serving the Lord because they will get some compensation because of it. But he says, look, look that is not a true shepherd. That is not a true bishop. Not someone who serves to get money from it, but someone who is of a ready mind. It is absolutely imperative that the pastor is always of a ready mind. His mind cannot be distracted, but his mind must be ready and able to receive that input from the Lord and to hear from the Lord. He must be of a ready mind. But he says this pastor is not to be a lord over God's heritage, but an ensample to the flock. Now, we usually use the word example, but it's not really by mistake, though, that the word ensample is used rather than the word example. Sometimes I think of ensample uh, as the word we could parse it out in and then sample. You think about the word sample. What is a sample? You ever been in the mall before? <laughs> You're walking down and they're, they hold these samples out. Hey, you want some of this? Hey, you want some of this? I love it when you go in an ice cream shop and they give you little samples. You know what I'm saying? And that's the sample, right? That's the sample of, of everything that they have. And this is supposed to be a prototype, if you will. This is supposed to be an exact replica, an exact demonstration of what it is that they're selling. So that if you eat this, then you're going to get at least the general idea, and it is to be an exact idea of what everything else is that they're trying to sell you. So in the same way as a pastor is to be an ensample to the flock, then his life is to be a sample of what the Christian life ought to be. And this is a fearsome thing for a pastor because this is the very life that he must live. And if he does not live this type of life, then he is not the pastor that God wants him to be. And then he says in verse 4, And when the chief shepherd shall appear, he shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Hey, there may be a man that is a shepherd of a flock, but he is not the chief shepherd. He is not the chief shepherd. But the shepherd, if he is a real shepherd, then he will point the flock to the chief shepherd. And the Bible says that if the shepherd is that type of shepherd, then when he meets the Lord, that he will see, receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Every, every pastor desires, a true pastor, desires that when that moment comes, I'll just speak personally, 
that I desire that when that moment comes, that not for my own glory, because all of our crowns will go at the feet of Christ anyway, but that in that day the Lord will say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. That's what we desire. Because all of us one day are going to meet the chief shepherd. We're going to meet the one who has led us our whole life long. We're going to meet the chief shepherd. And in that day, he says, for the man that's been faithful, he shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. And he continues to speak to the church, and now he's not as much speaking to the pastor or the bishop of the church, but then he's speaking to the younger, and he says, submit unto the elders, but not only is there supposed to be an order of submission and reverence and respect, but he says, yea, all of you, be subject one to another. That word subject means subordinate or to submit to. Uh, in other words, every person, young, old, whatever type that person may be, they are to be clothed with humility. Clothed with humility. We can never look at a person, whether it's the pastor or whether it's an older person, an experienced person, or anybody in that church, they cannot look at another person and say, look at me, i got to figure it out. Because all of us, no matter who we are, are to be clothed with humility, as it were a garment. We are to adorn ourselves with humility. Because he says, for God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. That means every single one of us ought to be governed in our lives by humility. And now, humility is a way that we live. Humility is the way that we live. It's the way we treat others. It's the way we speak to others. Humility is a way of life. And he says we ought to be clothed with it. We ought, to, we ought to put it on. We ought not to draw attention to ourselves. but We ought to clothe ourselves. We have to think on that a little bit. Clothe ourselves with humility. In other words, this is something that's visible to other people. They know that you're a humble person. I've met people like that in my life. I've met people that were humble people. I met people that maybe were not so much humble people. But a person who's a humble person clothes himself with that. And others know when they're around that person that they are clothed with humility. And here's the, the, the very fearsome statement that God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. We could talk on that for a while. We won't tonight. But do you want God to resist you? you be a prideful person. God will. And uh, some of us, especially myself, have had to learn that. That God doesn't deal with that. God doesn't share His glory with another. We, we must be humble. And if we are prideful, remember when Brother Holmes was here, we talked about that. If you're prideful, God, God resists that. He said, I can't use that. I can't use that. You can't be used by God if you're a prideful person. He says, God resisted the proud, but then he giveth grace to the humble. I don't know about you, but I want to be in that category where God gives grace to the humble. Because I don't know about you, but I need grace every day. God gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, in the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Hey, the Lord does exalt sometimes, but it's not our own work. Promotion cometh not from the east or the west, but it cometh from the Lord. So we can't exalt ourselves. He says, submit yourselves under the mighty hand of God, and then God, when He sees fit, and when He sees right, then He will exalt you in His way. I heard it said this way one time, that God knows how to humble us without humiliating us, and then He knows how to exalt us without flattering us. God knows how to humble us without humiliating us, but then He knows how to exalt us without flattering us. In other words, there are times in our life where we need to be humbled. You ever been there before? <laughs> in your life where you had to be humble? Well, God can do that. He can take care of that in the quietness and the solitude of your own life and your own relationship with the Lord. The Lord can take care of pride and He can humble you. But God is so kind and gracious that He doesn't always humiliate us in front of everybody. But He knows how to deal with those things in private. But then sometimes the Lord will exalt a person for his own purposes, but he can do that in such a way that that person, uh, when continuing to be humble, does not fall flat on their face. Because that can happen with, when a person is exalted, when a person is exalted, 
then is, it, that person becomes very liable to fall flat on their face because of that exaltation, because of the pride that comes from that. So the Lord waits a lot of times until the person's ready. And so he says, God resists the proud, gives grace to the humble. And then he says that humble yourself and God in his time will exalt you. And then the wonderful verse here in verse 7 that I wanted to just focus on for a few minutes. He says, casting all your care upon him for he careth for you. Now, we'll come back to that in a moment. But notice, I think verse 8 is something we ought to be looking at. And listening to, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion, walking about, seeking whom he may devour. All of us have to realize. All of us have to realize that the devil is walking around, trying to devour us. He is stalking. He is looking around, trying to devour people. He's trying to devour especially Christians who he thinks are vulnerable. And uh, he goes after them. And he stalks. I heard the preacher years and years ago. I don't even know how old I was. I just know it was a long time ago. I remember the, the preacher talked about the lion that looks at the herd of zebras. And he sees a whole herd of zebras. And he looks at them and he sees the strong ones in the front. That they're running and they're bounding at top speed. And they're doing good. And they know the lion's around and they are just keep on moving. And that lion is hiding behind the bush. He's hiding in those thick grasslands in that savanna of Africa or somewhere. And he's watching and he sees the strong zebras go by and he lets them alone. But then he notices that one of the zebras gets separated from its mother. And this is a little zebra. And this is a zebra that did not have a lot of self-confidence and maybe been wounded, maybe had a problem. And he veered off from being near his mother and the lion said, that's the one I'm looking for. And it's easy prey. Very easy prey to get that one because he's been separated from his mother. And whenever we leave, <laughs> whenever we leave the protection of the fold, whenever we leave that protection that comes when we're close to the Lord and, and with His people and loving His people and learning from His people and learning from the shepherd that God gives, and when we leave that protection, we become vulnerable to the world. We become vulnerable to what the devil is trying to do. And when we get out of the Word of God, when we get out of prayer, we get vulnerable to the devil and his attacks on the mind. His attacks on us. We get vulnerable to those things as soon as we leave the safety of God's protection and God's fold and we're not dwelling with the Lord and staying close to Him uh, by our side. The one who's really strong then we get weak when we get separated and we start going our own way. And so, it's so important that we stay with the Lord because the devil is trying to devour us. He's trying to devour me. He's trying to devour you. But how do we deal with it? He says, resist him steadfast in the faith. We resist him. Resist, resist, resist. Resist the devil. Steadfast. Be strong in the Lord. Resist the devil when he comes after you. In the faith. What does that mean? It means by knowing that Christ is the conqueror. That Christ is the victor. And we trust Him to give us the victory over the devil. And he says, Now, resist him knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. In other words, look, you're not the only one being attacked. You're not the only one that's dealing with the adversary. He says the same things are happening everywhere else in the world. And they all have to do the same things. And he says, therefore resist them steadfast in the faith. Now what is this verse? Let me give you three very simple things concerning verse 7. And this will be brief. Casting all your care upon Him. Now all those other things we just talked about, they're not all disjointed, but they're related. They're related. As we are trusting the Lord, as we're resisting the devil, as we're sober and vigilant and humble in our lives and following the chief shepherd and being fed by the Lord, then we can understand what this means. Casting all your care upon Him for He careth for you. Let me give you just three basic things. Number one, notice this please. The commandment to cast. What is the commandment that He gives? 
He says, casting all your care upon Him, for He careth for you. It's the commandment. Now when I read a verse like this, I believe that He's telling us this is what we ought to do. We ought to cast our care upon the Lord. This word cast means to throw upon. It means to cast upon. It means to fling your burden on the Lord. You know? I was just, today, I was emptying a whole truckload of scrap wood. And I was at a place where all kinds of dirt and grime and dust and wood chips were being stirred up everywhere. Blown in my face. Blown in my face. I opened the doors up to throw everything out. It's blown in my face. And I thought, I'm going to be itching all day today. But <laughs> it's not as bad as I thought it was going to be. And when I was there with that wind blowing, I said, I want to get this stuff off this truck as quickly as I possibly can. So what did I do? I started flinging it. I started flinging it. I started casting it. I said, get the hens. All right? I started casting that out. Get that out, because this wind's blowing in my face. And I don't want to feel this anymore. So I just started pushing it off and casting it off. And let me say, that's exactly what we do with our burdens. We come to the Lord and we say, Lord, you have it. Just fling it. Just throw it. Just cast it. Like you cast a line. How many like to fish? How many of you have ever caught anything before? How many of you, like me, could count on one hand? How many of you caught in your whole life? It's a little bit of exaggeration. But what do you do? You cast it out and you cast it till it's a speck in the sky and then it goes and plops in the water there. But then what do you do? When you're an angler, you start reeling it back in. That's what we do with our burdens, don't we? We cast them out and then we say, oh, well, I need that back. Come on. I need that back. I need that burden back. Hey, listen, you already cast it out. Just leave it out there. Just leave it out there. Psalm 55, verse 22, Cast thy burden upon the Lord, and He shall sustain thee. He shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. That's wonderful. Psalm 55, 22, Cast thy burden upon the Lord, and He shall sustain thee. He shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. Do you need to be sustained by the Lord? Cast your burden on Him. Cast your burden on the Lord, because He'll bolster you. He'll hold you up. He'll sustain you in those dark times. Cast thy burden upon the Lord. The commandment to cast. Notice number two, please, the cares that we cast. What are the cares? He said, casting all your care upon Him. Your care. What is your care? It is carefulness, anxiety, worry. I was about to ask how many of you are like me and you worry all the time. <laughs> what does He say? Cast it. The worry the fear, the anxiety. He says, cast it on the Lord. Listen, cares can be a great distraction. It can be a great distraction. Hey, listen, you can miss out on a lot of things that God's trying to give you when you're caring about everything all the time. You're worried about everything. You're going to miss a lot of things. You're going to be distracted from what God has for you. Sometimes it's right in front of your face. You can't see it. Because you're so distracted by cares. He says, it'll be a great distraction. And he says, cast all your care upon him. That's the scope of the commandment. He says, cast all your care upon him. In other words, you shouldn't be holding any of it. You shouldn't be keeping any of it. Jesus said, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give thee rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Why is his yoke easy? Why is his burden is light? Now, you know what that means? Do you know what a yoke is? The two oxen that were in the field, they had their yokes tied to their necks. Why did they do that? Because one oxen would have a hard time. He'd be out of breath by the end of the day if he did it all himself. But when you got two oxen doing it, it's a lot easier. Just two are better than one. But it's not just unequal, but the Lord, when we bear the burden with the Lord and we allow Him to bear it with us, it's not just two, but now it's one. Because He's bearing the burden, we're just coming along with Him. Because He's the burden bearer. The Lord is the burden bearer. What does He say? Cast all your care. Everything that you care about, everything you worry about, everything you fear about, 
He says, cast it upon the Lord. What does he say? Cast it upon Him. Upon Him. When you have cares and worries, don't just cast them on everybody else around you. Whoever wants to listen. Sometimes we need help and we can talk to people, but my point is, what does he say? Do you really want relief from the burden? He said, cast it on the Lord. That should be our first recourse of action. We should go to the Lord first, say, Lord, I have a burden. I have a burden. I want you to take it. I want you to take it away from me. Cast it upon the Lord. This is a commandment. Cast all your care upon Him. These are the cares we cast. What's the third thing? Not only do we see the commandment to cast, the cares we cast, but notice the third thing. We see the cause, the cause for the commandment. The cause for the commandment. What does it say? Casting all your care upon Him, for He careth for you. He says, for He careth for you. That's the, that's the cause. That's the reason for this commandment. That's why we can cast all our cares upon Him. This is the very cause of it, because He careth for you. He careth for you. You can know... At any time of the day, any time of the day or night, that the Lord cares for you. That I'd encourage you. At any time, the Lord cares for you. And He says, this is why you can trust Him and cast your burden on Him. Because you know that He cares for you. Hey, listen, I may cast my line out into the water and not know if I'm going to get a fish, but if I cast my burden and my care upon the Lord, I know that He cares. I know that He cares for me. Yes, He cares. I know He cares. My Savior cares. When the days are dreary and the long nights weary, I know my Savior cares. We always know He cares. He says this is the very reason that we are to cast our cares upon Him because we know that He loves and cares for us. What does it say in Psalm 55, 22? We referenced it a little bit ago. That He will never suffer the righteous to be moved because He cares about each of us and the worries that we have. Hey, you know what? You should not care about everything because He cares for you. We care about all the things, but He cares for us. And He takes the cares and the worries as we cast them upon Him. Remember on the cross? Remember on the cross? It sometimes can be almost a baffling thing. When Jesus was hanging there on the cross and He said, my, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Remember that? He said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why did He say that? He said that so that you and I would never have to say it. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He said that so that we would never have to say it. Because God put upon His own Son the sin of the whole world. Because He turned His back on His own Son so that He could take our punishment and our sin. And He took that forsaking and that separation from His own Father. Because of that very reason, He's made the way so that we will never be forsaken. There's never a time in our lives where we can say, God has forsaken me. The Bible says, He will never leave thee or forsake thee. He'll never leave thee. He'll never forsake you. You can always know that as you cast your cares on Him, He careth for you. I told you the story about the preacher who was trying to counsel someone and... Uh, she was pouring out everything, and he said, well, let me ask you one question before we keep going. Do you think in all this God has forsaken you? Do you think God has left you? Do you think God has forgotten about you? Well, if we believe the promises of God, we know that He hasn't. We know that He never, for, he know, we know that he never forsakes us. He never forgets us. 
but He always cares for His own. What is the commandment? The commandment is to cast, to throw it upon Him, to fling your burdens upon the Lord. And that's all of our cares. Everything we deal with, everything should be cast on Him. And why can we do this? Because we know that He always cares for us. We know that He will never forsake us. This is a Savior that we have. We have a Savior who doesn't just save us and then leave us and say, you can fend for yourself. You can figure it out. But the Lord Jesus cares for us. The Bible tells us that He ever liveth to make intercession for us. And why am I repeating that? Why? What am I trying to say? You don't need to worry and care and fear because the Lord knows and the Lord cares. The Lord cares about those things. He can take them and make something amazing out of them when we give them to Him. But when we keep worrying, keep fearing about everything, we may miss out what God has for us, but know that He cares for you. And cast all your care, cast all your care upon it. Let's bow in prayer together, may we?